Good morning, St Luke's. Here we are and we've come to the very end of our Bible readings in the book of Psalms. And so we're going to have a little look at Psalms 149 and 150 this morning. I think both of them deliberately uh, end with songs of praise. Uh, if you like, it's a sense, it's a marker that our journey uh, of these songs and prayers uh, that have come from God's people throughout the book of Psalms, they have included a uh, lament, um, struggle, cries for help, uh, reminders uh, for the need of righteousness. Uh, but the whole book ends with that sense of praise. Uh, so let's try and think about uh, the context uh, that these last two Psalms are summoning us uh, to praise in. Look at Psalm 149. It begins uh, with the phrase, sing to the Lord a new song. Now, I'll be honest with you, I simply can't keep up uh, with the production line of new Christian worship songs that are continually uh, being churned out. Uh, many of them I hear and they're really good. Uh, and there are many others that I hear that are, to be honest, absolute dross. Uh, something being new uh, doesn't always mean that it is good. That would be a misunderstanding of this verse. In the same way, though, uh, where Psalm 150 lists uh, trumpet, harp, lyre, tambourine, strings, flute and cymbals as the instruments to be used in accompanying singing. I have heard this uh, presented as a prescribed list uh, and that actually we shouldn't use any other instruments because these are the only ones laid down uh, to accompany our singing. Uh, obviously, the implication of that being that the electric guitar and drums are totally out. Uh, that, too, would be a misinterpretation uh, of what the psalm is getting at. What well, we do see accompanying the new song and the instruments both plucked and blown uh, is a combination of voice and movement. Look at 149 verse 3 and 150 verse 4. Singing is accompanied by dancing. Uh, again, I wouldn't claim that this is prescribed. Uh, however, I think there is a question for us to ask ourselves over the restraint that often dominates our worship, uh, particularly in Britain. How can we learn to let go and to immerse ourselves fully in the praise of God? Second thing to notice is the context for Psalm 149. It's clearly warfare, isn't it? as indeed is the case with many of the other psalms that we've looked at. However, as we perhaps see the warfare clearly mentioned in the second half of the psalm, don't miss the tight relationship that exists between the people and their maker and king. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. The Lord takes delight in his people. This is not an absentee ruler exercising decision-making by decree at a distance. So what have we got? We've got new songs, we've got praise, we've got warfare. How do we tie it all together? Well, along with the Psalms, uh, we find the instruction to sing a new song in Isaiah chapter 42, specifically in verse 10. Now here the context uh, is the coming of the Lord's servant. In Revelation chapter 5 verse 9, again, a new song is sung, uh, but this time to the Lamb, who takes the scroll of God's decisive action in the world. The songs praise the Lamb for his death. Uh, move forward into Revelation chapter 14, verse 3. A new song there is sung as the people of God gather around the Lamb. And the point specifically being made is that this is a song only for God's people. Jump back a bit in the New Testament and you find Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Here it reminds us that we as Christians are in a battle. To read specifically, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms. If that is the battle that we're in, uh, what is the weapon that we are equipped with? Well, in verse 17 of chapter 6 of Ephesians, we're told the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Again, turn to Revelation and you'll find that it is in Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, uh, who holds uh, within his mouth uh, a sharp, double-edged sword. Likewise, in chapter 19, 
verse 15, Jesus comes to deliver a final victory from which follows the uniting of God and his people in the new Jerusalem. And he holds a sword, the sword of the, uh, representing his word as the means of doing that. The songs of exuberant, unrestrained praise in Psalms 149 and 150 uh, flow from our certainty that we are Jesus' people who will share in his victory over sin, sickness, disease, injustice and all that is evil in the world. And then we will be joined with him and all of God's children in, in never-ending songs of praise. This outcome uh, reigns over all of human experience. And so whatever our situation, uh, whatever we see in the world around us, there is always due cause and occasion to sing together with whatever instrument uh, we can find. Uh, because Jesus will gather his people and exact the ultimate victory over sin and evil in the world. And we will be gathered to him in wonderful, joyous union. And so praise the Lord, praise the Lord is the message of the Psalms. Let us pray together. Lord, we praise you as you dwell in our hearts by your spirit. We praise you in the heavens above. We praise you for your acts of power and all surpassing greatness. We praise you with our whole beings. Lord God, we praise you in Jesus Christ, our Saviour, now and forever. Amen.